Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Come, take the light that is never overtaken by night. This invitation is given to us every year at the Paschal Midnight Service, when the light of Christ is brought out from the altar area that represents his tomb and is spread among the people. And as we read on that first Sunday of Pascha in the Gospel according to John, it is the light of Christ that illumines all and shines in the darkness, but is not overcome by it. Throughout the year, we continue to proclaim the power of this light when we sing or recite one of the most ancient hymns of the church at every Vesper service, Fos y Laron, or in English, O Gladsome Light. Our faith relies on this light and the revelation that makes us believers. Jesus says, while you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become children of the light. And by our baptism, we become children of this light. In today's gospel reading, Jesus tells his disciples that they are to be lights of the world. He, enc he encourages them to let their light shine before others so that all may see their good works, and as a result, glorify God. As Christians, we are called to shine forth the light of Christ in our own lives, illuminating the whole world with the love and compassion of our Lord. The church gives us models to help guide us in this endeavor, the saints. They are human beings recognized by the church as witnesses to the light of Christ in the world. And this week, on Friday, July 20th, we remember a modern saint, Saint Maria of Paris and those canonized with her, to whom I would now like to draw your attention. And this is her representation, one of her pictures on the front. We know little of the actual life of many of the saints of the church, but in most cases we rely on hagiographic forms that can often be reduced to mere caricatures. But with mother, now Saint Maria Skopsova, we have an embodied personality and some might say, all too human embodied in personality. She was an intellectual, a divorced woman, a political revolutionary, and towards the latter part of her life, a nun. She was a woman who could be frank, outspoken, strong-willed, and even sometimes quarrelsome. She was a monastic who divide conventional norms, among other things, smoking in public. One might imagine her sitting in a cafe in Harvard or Central Square, drinking her coffee and smoking her cigarettes, covered in her black monastic garb. And while this might not be so out of place for Cambridge, it certainly would be by traditional standards of monastic decorum. In fact, she often criticized classical monasticism as well as all that she perceived as deficient or dead in Christianity. She was someone who was shaped by the events of the 20th century, two world wars, forced immigration from her Russian homeland, and abjunct poverty, and who would subsequently lead a life of prayer, but one in the world, de dedicated to helping others. Her code of practice was based on the recognition of the dignity of all people who are created in the image and likeness of God. We are all called to venerate the image of God in our neighbor. And for her, it was essential to put oneself in their place. This understanding of what it means to love God and neighbor would form the basis of her life. Mother Bria was born in 1891, and as a child of landed gentry, she had a university education and was part of the cultural elite of St. Petersburg. She counted among her friends and acquaintances writers, poets, and political thinkers of the time. They would spend hours discussing politics, economics, theology. And as a result of these interactions, her interest in theology deepened, and she became the first woman to take classes at the famous Ecclesiastical Academy at the St. Alexander Nevsky Monastery. Forced to immigrate from her homeland amid revolution and war, as did many other Russians, she made her way to Paris. It was here that her life would change radically. Like many recent immigrants, she lived in poverty. Although she would continue to write and discuss and debate social issues and theology, her life after the war was spent in action. 
Her work with the Russian Christ student Christian movement put her into contact with many of the impoverished outcasts of the Russian immigration. And it was from this contact that she lived out her theology. Her model was the early monastics of the church. But would monasticism be a framework for her life? She was convinced that a new type of monasticism was necessary for the emigration, with a concern for the world as its focus. For her, the ethical imperative of the liturgy demanded that it be carried into the world. And she called it, quote, the liturgy beyond church bounds, unquote. Her base of operations was the house at Rue de Lomel, and it was here that she provided a fixed address for those needing to qualify for government assistance, cooked and served dinners to many hungry, being mindful not to just give them charity, but to empower them as much as possible, and provide counseling for those at need. And some of her ministry can be seen um, in the, depicted on the various scenes on the icon in the inside of your, for, of your cover of the handout. All were worthy of her efforts. Each was her neighbor. During the occupation of France, her philanthropy extended to many of the Jews in need as well. In addition to helping to feed those in need, she was also an active member of the resistance movement, smuggling Jews to safe locations, and in some cases, facilitating the falsification of baptismal certificates. And it was these activities that would lead to her eventual arrest and her banishment to the Ravensbrück concentration camp. Ironically, in many ways, her life in the camp was no different than her life outside the camp. She still led prayer services, discussed theology, gathered food for others, and attended to their phys other physical needs, as well as provided spiritual and emotional support. She devoted her life to the other. Eventually, she laid down her life totally for the other. Consciously stepping into the crowd of those selected for extermination at the camp, and thus taking the place of someone else. She was taken to the gas chamber on the 31st of March, 1945, on the eve of Pascha and as World War II was ending in Europe. And this scene is referenced in the icon, the next icon in your handout, this one here. She, along with what has been called, quote, other outstanding personalities of the spiritual history of the Russian immigration in France, unquote, was canonized by the Ecumenical Patriarch some 14 years ago on the 16th of January in 2004. Mother Maria was an example of someone who conquered the darkness of hate in a world turned but torn by war and rife with despair by letting the light of Christ shine through her life and works. She was not only all too human, but fully human living her life in obedience to God and for the other. As depicted along the border of this same icon, and you can read it along here, she once declared, our neighbor's cross is the sword that pierces our soul to co-participate, co-feel, co-suffer. This is love. The Kentuckian dedicated to her on the back cover of your handout affirms that St. Maria, quote, became an instrument of divine love, a bright star shining in the darkness, unquote. May Mother Maria be an example for us, wherever we are, to answer our calling to serve God and our neighbor in whatever way we can. And may we, too, let the light of Christ shine forth in our lives and works, so that others may see them and be so moved to give glory to our Father in heaven. Amen.